were on the totally they were totally on the left side of the equation. These were um, people who were working with the Palestinians, they're trying to help the people from Gaza to get to the hospitals. They were helping them to advance uh, their own interests. They were providing them with different technologies. They're trying to help them with water supply and everything else. And they were the first ones that were killed, literally slaughtered on the border. They were telling this invader, listen, I'm your friend, I'm trying to help you out, but it did not help. In other words, we have a bigger problem than what we think. We have today practically a war on two fronts. One is a war with bullets, and the other one is a war about knowledge and understanding of historical facts. And in fact, unfortunately, our enemies are lying through the teeth and many of the students and university professors would not care less about the truth. They could not care less about the facts. And they will accuse Israel on a variety of topics and a variety of issues which uh, have no root and no foundation. And if people don't have the good raw information in order to counterbalance the information that they are getting, suddenly it becomes a real serious issue. For example, I brought in my article, one of the examples, <clears throat> which I'll call the lie that the land of Israel was always a Muslim territory. They claim that the Jews came from Auschwitz and took away the Arab Palestinian land, and they are the vicious occupier of the homeland of the Palestinian people, which is a pure lie. If you look at a little bit into the history of the region, first of all, you know that never ever in the history of the world, there was an Arab country by the name of Arab Palestine in the land of Israel. Then if you look at the big picture, you look at it from the big perspective of the last two, three thousands of years, the people that were having their own kingdoms and domain in this region were the Jews. You had King David there, you have King Solomon there, you have the two temples there, the temples of Jerusalem. And this was something which if anybody just wants to look very superficially at the history, they will know that the Jews were there hundreds and hundreds of years before the invention of Islam, because the invasion of Islam into the mid middle, um, middle East happened only in the seventh century. And before that, there were already Jewish uh, institutions, Jewish uh, kingdoms, which were placed in this location for many years. And when the um, Bar Kochva's revolt at the end of the day lost to the Romans, the Romans called the area of the land of Israel, Palestina, and they called Jerusalem, Ilia Capitolina, because they wanted to make some separation between the Jews and their own homeland so that they shouldn't be in the Middle East. For some reason, the Roman didn't want to have the Jews there. But the Jews continues to live there, even after they were expelled from the region. And the Palestinians that um, the Romans were referring to were Greeks that were living on the seashore of the Mediterranean, which lost their positions already in the time of the King David. So they were the old enemies of the Jewish people. The modern Palestinians have nothing to do with the old Philistines, which are a totally different group. Most of uh, the Arab Palestinians are people who came from the surrounding countries to the land of Israel, and the presence there became bigger and larger as uh, the Jewish uh, entity built up their own homeland in their own ancestral homeland, because all the constructions the Jews brought into the Middle East needed labor, and they came to help in building the neighborhoods and the cities of the Jewish people. They had some instigators who wanted to take over the land, like Hajamin al Husseini and others, and the population at large fell for their messages. But the fact that Israel took away the land from the Arab Palestinians is false never existed, and the kids are running in the university campuses complaining about the occupation, which practically did not exist. 
At the same time, Israel was out of the Gaza Strip since the year 2005. There was not even a dead Israeli body there because when Israel left the Gaza Strip in 2005, Israel removed even the Jewish cemeteries from the area in order to avoid any conflict and problem with the local Arabs. So all these complaints are totally bogus. <clears throat> and in fact, Gaza has a border also with Egypt. So if Egypt thinks that the Palestinians should go wherever they wanted to go, they could have left the, the, the Gaza Strip going into Egypt through the borders which they have in Egypt. But nobody's complaining about Egypt, they're all complaining about Israel. Now Israel had serious concerns about the security and the safety of the Israeli people because of the brainwashing of Hamas, which was going on in the Gaza Strip. But despite everything else, Israel allowed about 20,000 Hamas workers to come to work in Israel every day. Now, what happened there is, and the documentation is coming out now with more information that uh, the Israeli military is finding out, that many of the workers that came to work in Israel, even though Hamas was saying, oh, we want peace and everything is very good, it was all part of the big picture of deception which was guided by the Iranians. Because many of the workers were mapping out, mapping out the land around the Gaza Strip. They knew which house housed which, how many people, how many animals, when they were at home, when they were not at home. And you could not be grateful to people who was trying to kill you. Israel thought that we're gonna help them with a variety of things, with the economy, with everything else, and it didn't happen. They just used the generosity of Israel to work against Israel. Because once Iran pulled the trigger, suddenly all the people that Israel was hoping that they becoming their friends turned against Israel. And the Israeli military was not ready for that because the Israeli system for some reason thought that we don't have any acute problem with Hamas and the Gaza Strip so the guards were not so thick there were some people who were guarding the area but they were not ready to face thousands and thousands of people who will invade Israel simultaneously in 22 places now another lie that um, was uh, also blamed on Israel that uh, Israel would not agree to any peace agreement with the Arabs, which is also not true. Because Israel offered peace agreements already from the early days of the State of Israel. The very original two-state solution was established by the British after the Balfour Declaration in 1917. You know, in 1917, there was the Balfour Declaration. And uh, following that, there were all kinds of unrest in the region. The League of Nations gave um, its aspiration of the British a legal, international legal agreement that it is legally acceptable to rebuild the Jewish homeland for the Jewish people. And the British against that determination took about 77% of the land, which was Palestine, which was designated for the re-establishment of the Jewish homeland in the land of Israel and gave it to the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. They created Transjordan in 1946, which means we had already a two-state solution. And this two-state solution gave 77% of the land to the Arabs, which left 23% for the Jews. The Arabs were not happy with that either. In 1948, after the recommendation of uh, the United Nations Security Council to divide this remaining land between the Jewish state and the Arab states, Israel accepted it, the Arabs rejected it. Israel declared an independence on the 10% of what was left from the, his original designated area for their homeland, and they built, tried to build a country. The Arabs refused it, and they started a war to try to liquidate the new state of Israel. All the countries around the state of Israel invaded the new state of Israel in order to destroy it. 
Now this happened again and again. It again it happened in 67, happened in 73, until the whole process was very clear that they are not willing to make any peace accords with Israel. And in fact, after the Yom Kippur War in 73, Israel managed to get to some kind of a peace agreement with Egypt. And thereafter, they made the peace agreement with Jordan. And at the same time, the Palestinians refused any peace offer for any reason, for any percentage of land and autonomy that the Israeli presidents and prime ministers offered them. And the, all this was under the mediations of American presidents too. So throughout this time, they refused all these processes. Now, recently, in a couple of years ago, we had the Abraham Accord, when additional four Arab countries made peace agreement with Israel. And the big trophy was supposed to be the new peace agreement between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Iran could not stand for that. They wanted to undermine the process. And this was one of the things which helped them instigate this tumult in the Middle East in order to stop this peace process within the countries in the region. Because if you'll have a great alliance between Saudi Arabia and Jordan and Israel and Egypt, it will undermine the expansionism of Iran in the region. So they were instigating the problems between the Hezbollah in the north and Hamas in the south to try and stop this process. Now, in order to understand this process better, I think we have to look at the big picture of how they're working on undermining the public opinion, because most people don't understand what's going on in their own neighborhood. They don't understand what's going on around themselves, even though the dangers of having Iranian ideology combined with socialist ideology taking over every aspect of life, sooner or later will undermine this freedom and the ability of individuals to practice their own will. You know, we respect open societies to be able to communicate, to learn, to go, to come, to interact. They don't, they have the rigid rules. They thrive for power. For them, the elites are the ones who have to control everything. And the people have to work and worship the elites. They'll tell the people what to do. And they're doing it by indoctrinating them through the schools, through the educational systems. And this is happening also in the United States and in Europe. There was a con con constant infiltration into the academia all over the world where professors and students were rooting to these ideologies, which they don't understand that if they will take over all these intellectuals and wonderful people are gonna become slaves. They won't be able to practice freedom at all. And therefore we have to be able to show them and identify all these trends in order to save our own freedom. You know what they say that the Jews are always a canary in the mind. What happened to the Jews today doesn't stop with the Jews because sooner or later, everybody else is gonna be suffering from the same process. It happened also when Hitler took over, when the Jews took, originally they thought that Hitler is a great guy. Many Jews supported him, but once he assumed power, the first ones to go to concentration camps were the German Jews. But once he controlled the Jews and tried to exterminate them, many millions of non-Jews suffered as well until the Allies had to do a major operation to try and liquidate Nazi Germany by killing millions of people. So this is not a peaceful process. And the sooner we'll stop it, the better it's gonna be for the free world. And therefore, some of uh, the things that can alert us to the process and to see what is the ones which are motivating these new groups we have to see who is financing it, who is giving it all the money, why is it doing it? It will give you some indication of uh, the intent of these people. <clears throat> then you can see that these leadership that's so corrupt that some of the money is gonna be used for their own, own benefit. Like I mentioned earlier, many of the leadership of Hamas and, and others 
and the Iranians, they live very well. They have millions of dollars in their account. Abbas Pobrecito has only more than $100 million in his account. He didn't steal enough. But we know that he's not serving his people because you look at the educational system, you know that they are exploiting the people and they're brainwashing them. At the same time, we have to know that uh, if somebody is inciting and providing information which is false in order to brainwash you, they're probably not very nice people. And their intent is to control you one way or another. And if they promote unrest and they don't allow a free communication and conversation, and the argument that they're bringing are pure lies, then you know that you're dealing with the wrong group of people. And that's exactly the reason why they are running in the streets, forcing people to make all kinds of crazy statements. They were interviewing people in the streets to see if they know what Hamas is standing for. Many of the people had no idea what they're supporting. They, they, they took some people and said, you know what, I want you to sign a petition to support Hamas. I said, okay, I'll support it because it's a great cause. I said, okay, so let me just show you what they have in the charter. And they showed them the charter. I said, no, 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 I don't, I don't agree with that. I don't want to sign. So the key is education. So therefore, we have to educate ourselves. We have many good resources to do that. Stand with us is at the forefront. Last week, we had about 700 million hits on the websites of Stand With Us, between the Instagram and the Facebook and everything else. 700 million hits from all over the world because they want some reliable source that will give them some good information about what's going on. They have also a, room, a war room, which is a, a day-to-day minute by minute, up to date of what is going on. They call it the situation room. If you stand with us.com forward slash situation room, they'll give you information about what is going on now in order to know the facts as they evolve. But if you go to the stand with us.com forward slash booklets, you'll see 70 booklets, which is addressing a variety of topics some of them are even translated to other languages, including into Spanish, into Hebrew, into Arabic, and so on. Another good uh, resource is uh, the Jewish Virtual Library. If you go to jewishvirtuallibrary.org, you'll find a lot of good information about Israel. You'll find out also the book, Myth and Facts of the Arab-Israeli Conflict. For example, this book was translated into 11 languages, and it's all online for free. The latest one was translation into Arabic. So we have a new book in Arabic in the Myth and Facts booklet collection that people can read it in Arabic and get the facts, how about they accuse Israel of and what are the real facts. Then there's another very interesting website, which is memory.org. <laughs> memory is a Middle East Media Research Institute. What they do, they just videotape what all kinds of crazy preachers are telling the people, how they're brainwashing the people in their own language. And then they translate it into English, so you know what they said. Because many times these people speak in two different languages. When you take, for instance, uh, the spokesperson for Hamas, he will tell his people in Arabic, yeah, we had uh, this major invasion of Israel and we killed so many of them today, we're going to do it again tomorrow and after tomorrow until we eliminate them all. When uh, somebody speaks to them in English, they become a little bit more moderate. The fact is we have to know really what they intend to do. And then we have to identify what they're doing because many times they'll speak in one way and do something completely different. Like now they discovered under the hospitals in Gaza that they had a whole collection of uh, ammunition and explosives, and they were even keeping hostages at the basement of the hospitals. Israel just found out about it right now. So we are dealing with a group of people who cannot be trusted. They can speak to you very nicely today because they want your attention and your support. But the truth of the matter is they don't care about you. They care about their own power and they care about the world domination which they are promoting because they want to control as much as they can. Now, I could go on, but I think I should stop 
and uh, I'll open the floor for questions and answers. And this way we can address uh, some topics that you uh, would like to uh, discuss. Thank you. Anyone have a question online or questions? was amazingly presented in such a short period of time, covering the entire history. I'm curious why there isn't- If there's a question, I cannot hear you. I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Now I can hear you. You, you presented such a, a large amount of information in such a short period of time, covering everything. Why? Is and this is only enough? scratching the surface, and this is only scratching right? the surface. But the summary was so succinct and clear. So why isn't there enough explaining like you just did? Why is it? it shouldn't be so complicated? That's number one. Number two, yesterday I was at a rally uh, with a bunch of Hamas people antagonizing, and the rabbi went to the other side, so I followed him. The question is, do you put a stand to evil or do you show that you're nicer? That's a very big question. Do you do you say we're not going to be bullied, we're going to show that we're tough, or do you de-escalate? This is an excellent question. Now, you have to distinguish. You cannot put all people under the same umbrella. Let's divide the groups into three parts. One are the people who agree with you and they know the facts and they'll stand up for what's right. These are the, I call it, you can preach to the choir. You have to give them the raw information because they'll be able to amplify it across the board. The other group is the one who are brainwashed and they have their own ideology and they entrenched in their opinions. Those people you will never convince, at least not at the beginning, because whatever you tell them, they'll think that you're lying and you don't care about anything and they know better because they were told about something totally different, which has nothing to do with reality. And they didn't bother to check it if it's true or false. Now, the big group is the one in between. All the people who really don't know what's happening and they, are, they will go because the friends went and they will go with their, it sounds more interesting or they want to hear more. But they are the people who have still an open mind. So these are the people that you have to face. This group of people, you want to get into conversation with them, explain to them the facts, show them the facts, and make them understand that they personally have a skin in the game. Now, the people who are trying to kill you, you cannot do anything nicely to them because they'll try to plot something to kill you first. And therefore, in Judaism, there is something which is called hashkem If somebody is coming to kill you, kill him before he did kill you. Why is that? Because the brainwashed people, they think that if they die, they go to the heaven and they get a lot of rewards in the higher levels of the world. And Abbas is giving a lot of money to his family and they will secure the future because they're getting more money from their authority than they can get from working. So they think they're doing something good. So you cannot speak to these people. You cannot explain to them anything. Their middle name is deception. You want to speak to them? They couldn't care less about what you're saying. They laugh their heads off and they say you're weak and you don't know what you're doing. And therefore, people who want to kill you, you have to show strength. Hamas has to understand that they are killing you and we want to stop this process before they finish their jobs. So if you try speaking to Hamas today, it's going to be a useless conversation. They proved it already time after time after time. They had the opportunity to move to a better place. They did not want to because the ideology doesn't let them. So the only language that you understand in these neighborhoods is the power. We have to understand something very important on top of that. We are thinking in some kind of a mentality of the West. They are thinking in a mentality of the old tribes of Saudi Arabia and the Arabian Peninsula and everybody else. In those days, whoever was the strong guy dominated. Every tribe which was the strong tribe 
controlled everybody else. Truth, facts, conversation meant absolutely nothing. When the Arafat made the agreement, the Oslo agreement with Israel, his people asked him, why are you making agreements with the Jews? So he told them, don't worry about it. I'm going by the rules of the Muhammad uh, prophet. What is the Muhammad prophet's rule? There was a, <clears throat> a tribe of Jews in Medina. Mecca and Medina, the original place where the Islam started. They were the tribe of the Koraya in that area. And in the early days of Muhammad, he did not have any power, but he wanted to build himself up. So he built good relationship with the tribe who was in his neighborhood. And he told them, you know, we work together as everybody's gonna be happy. Guess what? He built enough power in two years. And the next step was to kill all his uh, good friends and neighbors from the Koraya. So when Arafat told his people, don't worry about it. We're making agreement based on the concept of our prophet with the Koraya. Everybody know what he was talking about. We'll deceive the infidel. When we'll have power, we'll kill them. And therefore, specifically to answer your question, if you deal with the bad guys, the only language that they'll understand is the power. If you control them, they'll be quiet. And if they're buried, it's going to be wonderful quiet. If you speak to anybody else, there you have hope that maybe some of them will understand that their future is on the line and you give them a better path forward. And if they'll understand, in fact, there are many Arabs who applaud Israel privately. Some of them applaud Israel openly. Look at the son of Hamas. He's going all over the world speaking for Israel. Many others do the same because they know that Israeli Arabs live much better in Israel than they live in any other Arab country. They have more freedom. They'll, they can elect their favorite members to the Knesset. They can go and work. They can eat. They can travel. Nobody's telling them what to do. So there's a different way that we have to speak to different people based on their entrenchment in their level of brainwashing. So your question is very correct, but you have to address it in terms that these people understand. If you deal with people who are entrenched in the ideology of the tribalism of the Middle East, it's a total different ideology than what we have in the West, which is more accommodating, more liberal, more open. You cannot use our concept to convince them. They don't buy it. They consider you weak if you do it. Look what Iranians are doing to the Americans now. They think America is weak. They bombed American assets in Syria and in Lebanon, in, in uh, Iraq, 56 times as of today, in the last month. They think that you think that they, they think that um, Biden and his administration are strong. They think that they're laughable. Otherwise, they wouldn't have done it. With Trump, they did not play games. Trump told them, stop bothering me. They did not. He killed Soleimani. And then the message went to the Iranians, today it's Soleimani, tomorrow is the Ayatollah. So you better kiss, stop it. And guess what? You had a couple of years of quiet. They didn't do anything. So unfortunately, those people understand only power. And real power, which is backed up with real evidence. Hello. 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 <laughs> My name is Jasmine. Uh, wait one second, I'll put you down. There. Um, so my question is, is there any way that we can help stand with us to promote their their posts when it comes with to the algorithm? Because I've noticed, for example, that when I'm on Instagram or I'm in Twitter, I noticed that there are some stuff that appear first other than the stuff that I want. For example, like if I go into a post, I notice that there's pro Hamas and pro, pro Palestine stuff first before everything like that I want, you know, like the like Israel, pro Israel and everything. So I was wondering if there's any way that I can help you guys. This is a very good question. Unfortunately, many of the algorithms are being controlled by the wrong people. So they won't let the real information float correctly and absolutely objectively. 
And uh, we stand with us if you manage to share that information with your own peers. Most of the information is readily available on the website. So you share with them the information that they can go and bypass the algorithms and go directly to the website and they get the raw information straight from there. And then they share the information with their own friends. Now, the same problem we had also with PragerU. You know, PragerU.com has a lot of good information on general topics, including about Israel. They also have major problems with all these algorithms because there are some bad operatives who are working all these algorithms and trying to cause trouble and putting their own elements into these conversations. And therefore you have to let all your networks know. If you let all your networks know that they should go directly to the source, then suddenly you bypass the algorithms. You can go directly to stemwithus.com and you go to the situation room, you get information. You go to the booklets, you get the booklets. You want to have a post, you get the post. You go to the Jewish Virtual Library, you go st straight there and you get the, the information right there. And therefore, unfortunately, we don't have enough power to control the algorithms. They have, uh, right, for instance, um, they say that the new Twitter, you know, the X is a little bit better than uh, the Instagram and the Facebook. But still, you have also Rumble. Rumble should have also quite a lot of good information there with less uh, scrutiny by certain algorithms. There's another factor in addition to the algorithms, there are also the bots that many times are not even real people. They put in machines and all kinds of computers which are working to amplify a message and to sell more messages which are not even human. So once you know that, then you know that you have to go to the right places. And once, once you have the information, you can share it, as I said, with whoever you can and alert them to the fact that you may not find the information. If you're talking to me, I don't hear you. Now, now, yes? Now I hear you. Yeah. So thank you so much, Doctor. Um, there is a, um, probably we'll, we'll have more people listening to the, to the um, important um, conversation we have with you. Um, there's people online that probably will also have questions, but I think it's good for today. I have an idea that maybe we can create. I don't know if, how much can we help? Because the main class today was what can we do to help? Is maybe we can create like a group chat, um, that every time there is a new um, information from stand with us, we post on the group chat, and every everyone part of the group can share with all the contact and, and move a little bit more the the social media, especially if they, they add a comment. So the algorithms will move more. I don't know how much can we help, but at least we feel like we're really doing something from Chutzlar and from out of Israel. Because there you can do two things. Number one, you can share raw information from the booklets. The other booklets uh, which are available online in standwithus.com forward slash booklets. And then you have the information which is in the situation room, which gives you current event immediately, what's happening today. The other thing which you can have is um, in the Jewish virtual library, for instance, the myth and facts have many myths and many facts. So you can bring up always some kind of a myth, some kind of facts, so people know information, raw information, because people need to know what's going on and they need to know also the history because you cannot uh, address all the topics based on current events mm -hmm. because some of the information you need to know already from beforehand. So therefore you need both. You need the uh, raw information and then you promote the booklets and it's easy to read the, sh the short booklets and they're very interesting. 
And then you have the situation room, which gives you updates about what's going on in the current events. That's a good idea. And we then the thing, thing is uh, that it's true with memory. When they tell you what are the Arabs talking to themselves and what are the preachers saying to their own people, and then you know what to expect. So you know what are they saying, you know how they are lying, but if you are well informed and you know the truth, then it's easier for you to stand against the incitement and you can advise your friends about the facts because many of them are really totally ignorant of the facts. And therefore, if you share with them real facts, nobody can move you because you are well informed the information that you have is well documented. You see, we don't have to lie. We'll show you. You know, it's many true. of the things already written in the Bible. Somebody said the Jews had nothing to do with the land of Israel. I said, that's interesting. Did you hear about Marata Machpelah? Did you hear about the forefathers? Did you hear about King David, about King Solomon? Did you go to Ir David and see all the archaeological inventions and excavations that we found there? So suddenly they accuse you of something and they realize that they are not talking the truth. And therefore suddenly you try to tell them, show me where was this Arab-Palestinian state in the neighborhood of Israel? It never existed in the history of the world. There is no documentation for anything. They have no currency, they have no documentation, they have no capital, they have no leadership. So once you show them facts, suddenly they are thinking again, so maybe I'm deceived. And that's all what you need to do. Need to educate. understand that they are deceived and they are being manipulated, the ego will kick in. I said, why do I have to listen to people who don't look after my own interest? They look after their own interest and they're exploiting me as an idiot to serve them to advance their own ideology. So therefore you need to do everything. You have to know the history, if you know current events, and you know how to put everything together for people who are willing to listen. Those who don't want to listen to you, you can do whatever you want. They won't believe you. They'll say that uh, the Palestinians would have before the Jews, even though it has nothing to do with reality. The latest uh, story it's was so, the Canaanites. You know? It's so funny. They always, they're saying, uh, if you read the social media, some infamous people actually are saying that the October 7th was invented by the Jews. Correct, correct. There are some people who are doing that. Too. Those people you can do nothing of. You cannot even... Those are the call, we call them the Amalek. Yeah, you it's have to no explain solution. to them. The, the thing what you have to explain to them, you know what? You have your truth, I have my truth. If you believe these people, that they are good people, they're going to get you personally tomorrow. If you do something that they don't like, you're going to be the victim tomorrow. Right. So then they listen, what do you mean? I said, yeah, guess what? you personally are going to be victimized by these people because they don't respect you. They laugh their heads off having idiots like you who carry their water and tomorrow if they don't need you anymore, you're finished, you're toast. They're using their own people as a human shield. Guess what they're going to do with you? You're expandable. You're nothing. Thank you so much, doctor. You're very welcome. Uh, I think it's a good uh, doctor. The last, well, the last thing um, that I think we should um, we should um, finish the the today conversation is what that personal question. You as a experienced person of many wars that you live in your life. Uh, in Israel, from Israel. What do you think is going to happen now? This is the last question, and then where did you go? What, what do you think is going to happen from now on? Because it, every day we have new good new news. Thanks God, good. Like, the army is getting there, is getting there. They, they're finding now more and more um, um, tunnels and getting close to, to the hostages. Well, I don't know. I mean, we don't know. Do you have any feeling what's going to happen or, or absolutely no? Do you have any you know, expectation? I would love to be able to become a prophet <laughs> and know what's going to happen tomorrow. This would be amazing. Yeah. Unfortunately, nobody can predict it because everything is so 
changeable and variable and um, movable. But in general, I think that if uh, Israel will have the ability to continue the plan of whatever they have, they're going to take over the Shiva hospital. They're going to find out everything which is going on there in the basement. And I hope they're going to finish it in the next couple of weeks because Israel cannot sit there and in the war situation for years. Israel is not a big country like the US. We cannot afford being in war for 20 years. We have to finish it. And we have to give an example to the Hezbollah that it's not worth their while to cause trouble because if they cause trouble, Lebanon is going to look like Gaza and they don't want that. So uh, I hope that it will convince the Iranians to back off and um, the Iranians should feel that they have a skin in the game. Trump showed them not to mess up with him because he told them if you kill any additional Americans, you Ayatollahs are going to be dead and they stopped the, the game. So now there is a possibility if the Americans are going to be a little bit more strict and they become a little bit more um, rigid in their interaction with the Iranians, maybe something is going to change. I don't see what the Americans are doing. They think that appeasing Iran is going to be great for them. I don't see how they move away from that. Now they, they're talking about giving more money from Iraq, another $10 billion to the Iranians. I don't know if it's wise, and I don't know what they're going to do with that. In any case about Hamas, I think Hamas is going to be out in a couple of weeks or a couple of months. And then uh, we'll see how they're going to be able to rebuild the area in a non-militarized uh, manner. So Hamas cannot rebuild himself there. Then Israel will have to go after the leadership of Hamas, which is sitting in Qatar and other places, and uh, they'll have to be eliminated, like Israel did with the people who attacked. Uh, and you remember in Athens, there were the Israeli uh, sports people. Yeah, and so Munich, they, Munich. Israel did not rest until they eliminated all the people that yeah. were involved in that action. So probably they'll go after Hamas. And um, I hope this is a good warning for Hezbollah not to mess up with Israel, because if they want to live, they better not uh, cause trouble to Israel. And then let's see how long will the Americans keep their fleets in the Mediterranean to deter Iran and the Hezbollah, because I don't want Israel to be fighting two big wars at the same time, even though Israel can do it, because the Miluim that they have they had enough people to address both issues at the same time. But if once Hamas is eliminated, it's going to be easier to deal with the northern part, and maybe you won't need so many miluim, because you have to keep the Israeli economy going. The Israeli military is based on the miluim, which are the reserves. And the reserves are the people who are working in the banks, they're working in the restaurants, they're working in the fields. And you have to let these people go back to the work and not sit only on the borders and keep the borders quiet. And therefore, mm -hmm. Israel has to be very, very focused and not let uh, the bad actors think that they can get away with anything. So let's hope for better days ahead of us, but you still have some time that uh, the situation is a bit fluid. Amen. Thank you so much, doctor. Uh, thank you again. Um, if you want to stay one more minute, just one more minute, if you have to leave, don't worry. But if you want to stay, we are one of the uh, girls from K Space, uh, one of the staff of K Space right now in Washington, D.C., with a group of young people. And uh, she want to say two words quickly. Sharon, can you, can you just tell us how was your trip? How was Hi. The... Hi, everybody. I, I, I'm on, I don't know if you can, everyone can hear me. I'm, I'm on the bus. Our flight got delayed, but everything. Just being able to march with three over 200,000, almost 300,000 people was beautiful. And we were able to be able to, to live it and see it. Beautiful. Good job, Shalom. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shalom. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, doctor. I hope the uh, that uh, we have good news from now on and we have good news from Israel and we are back our 
uh, the people are that were family that were hostage that were taking hostage back home, and then no one from the Israeli soldiers, no one is injured. Father Shalom, they will return home. Amen, and amen. This will be the first step for Mashiach. Amen. amen. Thank you, Doctor, so much. Bye. Thank you very much. Now, yeah, they serve him the best chair. What do you suggest?